Welcome. We're going to talk about fiction terminology, especially as it relates to writing short stories. Uh, at the end of this PowerPoint, I also have a few short pointers and tidbits that may help you as you begin to write your own stories. We're going to begin with going through each element that every story needs to have. So the first of those is setting. Um, now, setting is something that we often kind of throw away when we write stories. Some writers just assume, oh, I'm in the present day and in the, in the current location. But you want to think about your story as something that can be read a hundred years from now and somebody would be able to locate themselves in your story. We can define setting in two ways. Chronological setting is when a story takes place. So again, a lot of writers might just assume, oh, my story set now, but we want to be really specific about this. So is your story set in 2017? Is it set a hundred years in the past? Is it set in the future? Or is it set in some alternate uh, universe where time, you know, isn't related to to our current measurements. Um, a chronological setting can also be as specific as, you know, what month is it, what time of day is it? So all of those things may be important for you to include. Physical setting is where does my story take place? And again, this can be as broad as another planet or in, in the US or in what state are we in? Um, it can be as specific as, you know, are we indoors? Are we outdoors? What's the description of the room we're in? All of those kinds of things. Um, I gave you some alternative settings here just to get you thinking about how big or small your setting could be. On the left here, you might recognize this bathroom. There's a horror movie that came out about 10 years ago called Saw. And about 80% of the movie takes place in this bathroom. Um, and so the setting actually becomes a real player in the plot of the story. Um, the setting begins to kind of close in uh, metaphorically around the characters, and so it becomes very important. On the other hand, I gave you a map of Westeros and Essos, which is the fictional world created by George Martin for his series Game of Thrones, um, A Song of Ice and Fire. And so this this whole this is a whole universe that he created um, very specifically and richly, and it has a whole history and all that kind of thing. So depending on what you're doing. Um, you may want to kind of zoom in on a single room, or you may want to zoom out to a whole different universe. Um, setting can really help you as you develop your characters and your conflict. So, for example, if your character um, is a germaphobe, can you put him in a setting where he maybe has to face that fear? Or if he is with another character whom he doesn't, doesn't like, um, can you put them in a confined space where they're trapped together and they have to work out their differences? Um, <clears throat> so you want to be thinking about how your setting can reflect or enhance some of your character's traits or maybe speed along the conflict. The other thing to think about with setting is how much is too much for you to describe. So a lot of writers get bogged down in describing their settings and kind of forget to tell their stories. Um, so this is the, a nice rule of thumb for, for when to describe something and when not to. We only want to describe things that either push the plot forward or develop the character. So if you're just describing things for the sake of it, then cut it. But if the description lets us know something about your character, for example, if your character is a detective, then he might describe his setting in terms of, you know, clues that he sees or things that he notices, right? A detective is probably always going to notice what time it is. He's probably going to notice, you know, if somebody drops a slip of paper out of their purse. Uh, he may not notice the beautiful flowers, okay? So you want to describe things as the detective would, and that lets us kind of into his psyche. So keep your setting limited to what pushes the plot forward and what develops your character. Next, let's talk about characters. So we can break characters into a couple of categories, flat characters and round characters. Flat characters are characters who only have one personality trait usually. So a flat character may be their character trait is goofy or funny or um, sneaky or something like that. So I gave you the example here of the two kind of clumsy guys from Pirates of the Caribbean. They really just have one personality trait, which is that they're klutzy and they kind of accidentally set a lot of plot points into motion. 
Also, flat characters are static, meaning that they don't change. So a flat character will finish the story the same way that he or she started. They're not going to go through any experience that opens their eyes or changes their mind in any way. Round characters are just the opposite. Um, and here I gave you the example of Han Solo. So first of all, round characters have multiple conflicting personality traits. Okay, so they're going to have personality traits that in many ways clash with each other. So Han Solo is, on one hand, he's kind of slick and sneaky. He's a, he's a smuggler and a thief, right? But on the other hand, he's also a good guy, right? He always comes through for his friends. He's brave. Um, he stands up for what's right. So um, those personality traits make him a complex, round character. And if you think about yourself, you probably also have personality traits that maybe don't match each other. Um, so maybe you are an introvert, but you also really love, um, you know, unloading on people and having deep conversations with people or something like that. There's also something you can do called using a character foil. So again, if your character is like a germaphobe, you can do what's called uh, a character foil, which is putting another character in your story for the sole purpose of um, bringing out your main character. So if your main character is a germaphobe, you can put in a character who's, let's say, like a young, attractive college girl who's a slob. Like, right, she only washes her hair a couple times a week, and she's got pizza boxes everywhere, and she's just a real mess. And so her presence in the story really just exists to show us what kind of person the main character is. So you put in uh, a character who is in many ways the opposite of your main character for the sole purpose of developing your main character. Um, so when you're, when you're thinking about your story, every story needs at least one round character. Um, a great story usually has more than one round character, but you have to have at least one. Um, flat characters, you can have as many as you want. Um, the last thing I want to leave you with is this idea of backstory. So it's important for us to know, um, you know, how old is your character? What was her childhood like? What's her favorite food? What's the worst thing that ever happened to her? What is she afraid of? All of these kinds of things. They may not make it into your story, but they will inform how your character speaks, how she carries herself, um, you know, what kind of people does she trust and what kind of people... Uh, does she mistrust? All of those things are going to be informed by the backstory. I'll have some exercises for you coming up to help you develop your character's backstory. Next, I want to talk about point of view. So uh, the point of view is the, the perspective from which you tell your story. And you really have two big choices, which is, one, you tell your story in the first person as if your character, your narrator is a character in the story. So the character is going to say, I, I do this, I do that. Um, third person is your other choice in which the narrator is not in the story but is observing the story. We'll talk about that in a moment. So first person narrators are again participants in the story. Most first person narrators are going to be the main character. So um, if you've ever seen or read The Hunger Games, rather, um, Katniss Everdeen narrates the story. She says, I, right? I am in The Hunger Games. I live in District 12. Um, and she's also the central character, right? She's the one around whom all of the action revolves. Um, <clears throat> however, that is not your only choice. So you can also have the narrator, first person narrator, be a minor character. Um, the best example of this is probably if you've ever seen or read Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is the main character of Sherlock Holmes. But uh, the story is not told from Sherlock Holmes' perspective. It's told from the perspective of his trusty assistant, um, Dr. Watson. So I gave you another example here, um, Nick Carraway and The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby is, is, is the central character in The Great Gatsby, but the story is not told by Gatsby. It's told by his kind of sidekick, Nick Carraway. So it's told, the story is told by a character who's kind of on the edge looking in. And that can be really interesting. Um, if you're going to have a first-person narrator, then you have to be really conscious of the unreliable narrator. Unreliable doesn't mean that you can't count on your narrator. What it means is that your character, Katniss or the Great Gatsby or whatever, um, your narrator has been through experiences that give them certain opinions, preferences, um, fears, prejudices, all kinds of things. 
And so when they describe something, they are not describing it objectively. I'll give you an example. If you have a character who is dirt poor and has been dirt poor her whole life, and she sees a Cadillac and decides that she's going to describe the Cadillac, she's going to describe that Cadillac as the most beautiful car she has ever seen, right? It might as well be uh, a spaceship for all she knows about it, right? It's gleaming, it's perfect, it's incredible. Um, whereas if you have a very wealthy character, like a billionaire character who sees a Cadillac, he's going to describe it maybe as, it's just a car, right? A Cadillac is nothing to a billionaire. Neither one of them is describing the Cadillac objectively. They're both describing it through the lens of their experience. So it's important to remember that your narrator may not describe things as they actually are, but will describe them instead the way that this particular character would experience it. We're going to take a break here and the video will pick up in part two.